Listen to what the Apostle Paul said to the Corinthians. He says, I thank my God always concerning you for the grace of God, which was given you in Christ Jesus, that in everything you were enriched in him, in all speech and all knowledge, even as the testimony concerning Christ was confirmed in you, so that you are not lacking in any gift, awaiting eagerly the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will also confirm you to the end, blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful, say faithful, faithful. through whom you were called into fellowship with his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. God is faithful, amen? Now, let me start the message today. Let me say this. This letter that we read this morning was written to Christian people. They were people who had come out of darkness into light. If you know anything about the city of Corinth, Corinth was a cesspool of sin. I mean, some of the things that we might not even imagine as far as happening in temples was happening in, in Corinth. And people were coming to the gospel. And when they came to the gospel, Jesus Christ changed their life. Uh, Paul said that the testimony of Christ was confirmed in these people. Uh, they were different. They came from darkness and came into the light. And so Paul is writing to them. And Paul is giving them some encouragement. Now, if you know anything about the letter of 1 Corinthians, you know that this church had some problems. They had some spiritual problems. They had some moral problems. They had some uh, just some pretty bad stuff going on inside the church. But right here in this first part of the letter, Paul says that God will confirm them to the end because God is faithful. And I want to develop my thoughts today all around that idea of faithfulness because faithfulness is very important. Think about this. Marriage vows mean nothing if they're not backed up by faithfulness. Think about it. They're just nothing but noise and words. I read a story uh, last night, and I, I, I shared it this morning, I think I shared it again, about this man who was writing a love letter. Y'all remember those? You're writing love letters to that special someone? I realize most of you now said, you're going, letters? What do you mean letters? You know, we send a text. So let's bring it up to speed. He was sending a love text, you know, or a love email, or an instant message, or whatever you call it. And he was writing to his special someone, and he was going on in poetic uh, 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 conversation about how this woman was so important to him. His name was Sam, and he said, you know... The, the ocean is nothing. If, if, if the ocean was standing in the way of me getting to you, I could swim the ocean and it would be as nothing. And the, the heat of the Sahara Desert would be as nothing as far as me getting to you. And nothing's going to stand in the way. And you're my all in all. You're my everything. Signed, Sam. And then he said, P.S. I'll see you Saturday night if it doesn't rain. In other words, he was just full of noise. You know, if it's not backed up by faithfulness, then your words don't mean anything. And so if we say that we have faith in God, but our God is not faithful, then it doesn't mean anything. <clears throat> in fact, if you put faith in an unfaithful person, you're going to get burned. Let me talk to the ones that are not yet married. Before you say, I do... You might want to consider whether or not the person you're about to enter into this covenant, you might want to consider about whether or not they are faithful. Whether or not their words mean anything. Otherwise, you don't have much that you can lean on. Faithfulness is something we need when we can't see what else is going on. We need faithfulness to trust what we can't see. And when we come down to the idea of trusting God, none of us here can see God physically. But according to his word and the testimony of many of his people, we understand that God is faithful. And that when you put your faith in God, the Bible says, whoever trusts in him will not be disappointed, will not be put to shame. Because he is faithful. And I want to encourage you that whatever you're going through in your life, God is faithful and God is doing something in your life. You see, if you are already a person who has put their faith in Jesus Christ... I want to tell you today that God 
is working on you. You might say, I haven't seen his presence and I haven't thought about God in years and months and weeks and, and I'm away from God and, and I, I can't see God's work in my life. I submit to you today that God is still working on you. If you're a person that's coming here today and you've never put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, let me suggest to you today that God has brought you here in order that you might do so today. And you can do that right where you are. In the last several weeks, we're seeing people come to faith in Jesus over the telephone, through text messaging. A good friend of mine who lived in Tennessee got saved while he's driving his truck down the road. You see, being saved, putting faith in Jesus means that with the whole heart, I trust in him. And there's no magic place to do that, although it is a good place to do that right here today. Right where you sit, you can put your faith in Jesus Christ right where you are, right where you sit. But we need faithfulness in a God that is faithful. And today I submit to you that we can have faith in God because in every case God is faithful. Now let me kind of develop this for you. When we talk about his faithfulness, I want to give you two things that I believe that, I, that we can say today that he's faithful with. Number one, the first thing is, is that his word is faithful. God's word is faithful. His word is faithful. The scripture says... That his word is established. Say established. Yes. Psalm 119 says this. Forever, O Lord, your word is settled in heaven. It's settled. Do you, under, do you understand what that means? God is not sitting in the heavens thinking, let me figure out how I'm going to say this. He's already said it. And the things that he's already said, he's not going to change. Jesus said it like this, said the scripture cannot be broken. The psalmist went on to say that your faithfulness continues to all generations. Did you catch that? Because God's word is settled, his faithfulness continues to all generations. That means anyone, whether it's this generation, the first generation, or the next generation, if they put their faith in Jesus, they will find out that his word is faithful. His word is established. It's already set in stone. It doesn't change. Jesus said it like this. If you build your life on my words, you will be building on a solid rock. A rock that what? Does not change. You see, here at Life Church, we, we preach the Bible. We believe the Bible is the settled word of God. The culture might have different ideas. The culture may try to redefine God's words and God's institutes. But we're not going to do that because forever his word is settled in heaven. And if his word is settled, then it's settled. So regardless of what's happening around us, we're going to preach God's word because it's settled and it's faithful. Not only is it established, but his word is authoritative. God's word is authoritative. When God says something, it's backed up with his authority. I'm reminded of a story. It's one of my favorite stories in the New Testament of a man with a withered hand. Now, that's what the, the Bible called it. I don't know exactly what his hand looked like. But it seems to, to me that he had a hand that he couldn't move. And when Jesus came to him, you know what Jesus told him to do? He told him to move his hand. Now, if that man was like some of us today... And Jesus told us to do what we can't do. You know what we'd say? We'd say, Jesus, you don't understand. I can't do that. Jesus said, stretch forth your hand. And we would say, Jesus, you're just not getting the picture. I can't do that. Oh, come on now. Y'all know what I'm talking about. There's so many things in the Word of God that God says this is what you do. And we have that attitude. Jesus, you don't understand. I just simply can't do that. Let me say this. If the Word of God says you can do it, you can do it. If Jesus tells you to stretch forth your hand, it doesn't matter what's wrong with your hand. When the word of God goes out, it's authoritative. And when Jesus says stretch forth your hand, guess what? It comes out. When Jesus tells you you can live different, you can live different. When Jesus tells you that you can trust him, you can trust him. When Jesus gives you his word, it's authoritative. There's a story about a centurion in the Bible. He was a military leader. This military leader was a guy that had superior officers over him. He had uh, officers or uh, soldiers under him. And he had recognized something about Jesus. 
he could see the work of God around Jesus. Because he noticed that when Jesus said something, things happened. Did you notice that? Did you notice that when Jesus says something, something happens? When people come to Jesus and receive the word of Jesus, things happen. And so this centurion had, he had a, he had a servant that was sick. And so he went to Jesus and said, Lord, my servant is sick. I want you to heal him. And Jesus said, all right, I will go home with you and I will heal your servant. Well, let me show you what this guy said. Let's put it on the board. This man said, this man came to Jesus. I think, I don't know if we're ahead of ourselves or not. Okay. Jesus, Jesus said to him, said, I'll come and heal your servant. And the man said, no, you don't have to do that. Just say the word and I'll be healed and my servant will be healed. And he said it like this. He said, Lord, I am not worthy to have you come into my house. Just say the word from where you are and my servant will be healed. You know what he said? He said, I understand that your word is authoritative. Just say the word. And he gives the illustration. He says, I know this because I am under the authority of my superior officers and I have authority over my soldiers. And he said, go and they go and come and they come. And if I say to my slaves, do this and they do it. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed. So what the man was saying was, I understand how authority goes. I've got people over me. If they tell me to jump, I jump. If I tell people to jump, they jump. Jesus, your word is authoritative. And if you say my servant is healed, then my servant is healed. God's word is faithful because it's settled and it's authoritative. It's greater authority than anything you've ever come across in your life. Not only is it settled and authoritative, but his word is powerful. God's word is powerful. Whatever God's authority says comes true. And whatever God determines to do gets done. In this passage of scripture that we read today, here's what the apostle Paul said. He said concerning these people in Corinth, he said that in everything you were enriched in him. In everything. What does that mean to be enriched? That means your life has been changed. Can you understand today that receiving the gospel means your life has changed? We're not people trying harder to be better. We're people that have messed it up, that have become better because Christ has made us better. The church in Corinth, the Bible says in everything they were enriched in him, in their speech, in their knowledge. And the Bible says the testimony concerning Christ was confirmed in them and said that they had not lacked any gift. They were awaiting eagerly the revelation of the Lord. In other words, they were looking for Jesus' coming. Guys, that is so otherworldly. I just wonder how many people here today are really waiting for the return of Jesus. Thank you. I don't know even what to say. <laughs> you know what a lot of folks think? A lot of folks think, I hope Jesus don't come back this year. I mean, I got things I want to do. And I want to see some other things happen. And you know what you're telling me? You're so in love with this world. You'd rather be here than go to heaven? The Bible says if in, if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all people most miserable. You know what that means? If all that we're looking for is for Christ to do us something, something good here, we're kind of miserable because we've taken away the greatest hope that we have. The greatest hope that we have is one day we're going to trade in this sin-cursed body for something better. The, the hope that we have is one day we're going to live with Him. The hope we have is one day we're not going to hurt anymore. The hope we have is one day the days of death will be done. The hope that we have is one day Jesus Christ will return to this earth and he'll exchange this sin-cursed body for one just like him. That's what he said. He said he's going to come again and receive us unto himself. And this church was looking for him. They were eagerly waiting the return of the Lord. They didn't know when he was coming. This was within a few years, you know, a few years relatively speaking of Jesus' a time on earth, and they were looking for his return. Ladies and gentlemen, it's time for the church of the Lord Jesus Christ to get back to looking for his return. He said he would return, and he is going to return. You know why? Because the word of God is faithful, and it always comes true. 
See, that's our hope. When you're going through those hard times and you don't know if you can make it anymore, just remember, look up, Jesus is coming. We don't have to do this forever. This is not all there is. There's some better stuff coming for us. And his word is powerful. Now, not only is his word faithful, but point number two is his ministry is faithful. Now, how many of you believe that Jesus walked upon the earth? You guys remember that? Okay, I hear a few of you. Let's see if we can convince the rest of you, all right? Let's try it again. Okay, we're getting a little better at that. How many of you believe Jesus lived? All right? And he died. Yeah. And he rose again. You're getting more spiritual by the moment, okay? He ascended to heaven. Now, do you believe his work is done? Now, when he was on the cross, he said it is finished, which meant that part of his work was done. The redemptive work was done. But you know what? He's not done working. Where's he working now? He's working on you. He's working on me. And he's faithful to do his work. This is going to be the best part of it today, guys. Because I want you to know that you might think that your life is total chaos and totally out of control. I'm going to show you today that Jesus knows exactly where you are. And he's not finished with you. You might have thought, I have done something so horrible that God will never deal with me again. I got news for you. He's not done with you. He is faithful to minister to you. Here's some of the things that he's faithful to do. First, he's faithful to change us. Say change. He's faithful to change us. How many of you need change? Okay. We got to go through this again, right? Let's try it again. How many people need to change? Now, do you realize you can't do that on your own? Can anybody admit that today? There's not a person in this room that can change their life on their own. I mean, yeah, maybe you might do a few things to, to do some external things to your life and change a few things like that. But the truth of the matter is you can't change what's in here. And until you change what's in here, nothing changes really. You see, the church at Corinth was churches that the Bible said they had been confirmed by, by the testimony of Christ. Their life had changed. Here are some of the things that Paul says was changed about them. Their speech. Did you notice that? I mean, how many of you can admit that sometimes we have problems with our speech? Or lack thereof. <laughs> like in moments like this. The proper answer is yes, Pastor Brian. I have problems with my speech. Right? And, and sometimes you're like, I wish I could learn to control my mouth. Amen, Brother Brian. <laughs> Preach it, brother. If you're not going to respond to me, I will, all right? <laughs> this church, Paul said they had been enriched in their speech. In other words, that same old ugly, vile stuff wasn't flying out of there anymore. Hello. You see, when Jesus changes you, he changes everything about you. And the reason why some of us can't control what's coming out of here is because what's in here is still ugly. Jesus said what's in the heart comes out of the mouth. So if you want to change what's coming out of here, you got to change what's in here. And which one of you can change that? Nobody in the room can change what's in there. It takes a work of God. And Jesus is still working on that. You know what? Through the years in walking with Christ, your speech will change. It will change instantaneously at the new birth, and then you will continue to grow. Let me say this to you. You never get to the place where you go, I got it. There's not anybody in this room or anybody in America that is walking so close to God that they don't have something left that needs to be changed. We all need to change. And we all need to get through our stuff and get the stuff changed and get the stuff out of our heart. But here in the church in America, we just totally ignore what's wrong with us. We rationalize it. 
We, we say things, well, that's just how I am. God doesn't want you to stay how you are. He will accept you as you are, but then he'll start changing you to be more like him. And the church in Corinth, their speech was enriched. Not only their speech, but their knowledge, the things that they knew. Not only their knowledge, but their behavior. They were acting differently. And you know what? It wasn't just an act. You see, if you have to act like a Christian, you've got problems. Because you're trying to act like something that you're not. There's a Greek word for that. It's called hupokrites. It's the word that means play actor. We would call that hypocrite. Pretending. And even in the early church, people tried to pretend. I'm thinking of Ananias and Sapphira that pretended to be so pious and pretended to bring a good offering to God. God struck them down. Aren't you glad that God doesn't do that every day in our worship services now? We'd have to change the, uh, the work description of our ushers, wouldn't we? Y'all think about that. He brings us into partnership with Jesus. When, when you come to Jesus, Paul said that he brings us into communion with him. That means he brings us into partnership with Jesus. Guess what? Sitting around here today are Christian people, right? People who have trusted Jesus, right? We're in partnership. We're in partnership together. That's why it's so important that we learn to work together. Because that's what he has done. And the thing is, in partnership with each other, God changes us. You see, there are three tools. This is not in my outline, but I'm going to say it because I say it a lot. There are three tools that God has given people to grow and to change. And if you deal, if you, if you don't have all three in your life, you're not going to grow and change. He uses the Word of God, the Spirit of God, and the people of God. If you do away with any one of those three, you're not going to grow. You're going to stay stuck. But God is faithful to change us because he brings us into partnership with the people of God. He puts us around people of God that makes us better. He puts us around people that the Bible says uh, iron sharpens iron. And we're better because we're around his people. Not only does he bring us into partnership with Jesus, but he gives us his spirit. He gives us his spirit. You see, the truth is. You, by your own power, by your own decision-making, by your own fleshly uh, uh, nature, you can't change on your own. The Holy Spirit of God is the thing that comes in and takes the Word of God and applies the Word of God and brings change to our heart. And the church at Corinth had received that. Not only does He give us His Spirit, but let me give you something that I think is going to really help you today. He brings the good out of the bad. Not one person here today would say, I'm looking forward to having a serious problem this week. But the truth of the matter is, some of us are. Some of us are in the middle of serious problems right now. Some of us, our life is turned upside down and we have no idea what's going on. And some of us, honestly, we feel like God has just totally abandoned us. We feel like he's out there somewhere. He cares about everyone else around here. But as far as what he's doing for me, he's not doing anything. And sometimes... We get so focused on what's wrong in our life that we just kind of write it off. Well, that faith thing just doesn't work, does it? It didn't work for me. I see the testimony of others, but it's not working for me. And sometimes you can say, I've gone through this so long. Surely God doesn't know about this anymore. Surely God has just wrote me off. God's not doing anything. My life is chaos. There's, there's a lot of reasons why your life might be chaos. You can either suffer because you have decided to stand for Jesus or you're going to suffer because you're not standing for Jesus. There's two ways. I mean, the truth is we're going to suffer. We're going to go through bad stuff. We're going to have bad days. We're going to have things that we just totally don't understand. But here's what I want to say to you about it. Even in the bad, God is doing something. God knows about it. God's well aware of your situation. He knows more about it than you do. And in fact, he's been watching you walk through that now for however long you've been walking through it. And you might say he's totally aloof and amiss and he's not around, but he's right in the middle of it. But what God is willing to do, he's willing to let you go through it and learn it through faith. And he's willing to let you go through the problem because in the middle of the problem, he's getting ready to bring something good out of it. 
If you ever hear somebody preach to you that if you serve God, you'll never have problems, let me suggest to you, pay no attention to that because it's not biblical. It's just not the way it is. Remember, God's word is settled. Jesus, the apostle Paul, they all taught us in the New Testament that sometimes we're going to suffer. It's just the way it is. So how does God do that? Is there any illustrations about that? Let me give you a story. There was an ancient kingdom who had a king who had ultimate power. In fact, this guy was like the number one king that had ever existed. This nation was the number one nation that had ever existed. The richest, the most powerful. This king's name was Nebuchadnezzar. And Nebuchadnezzar, how would you like a name like that? I am so glad that my latest granddaughter was not named Nebuchadnezzar. <laughs> Amen? By the way, I thank God grandchild number seven was born this past week. Amen? Okay, all you grandparents, you can cheer louder than that, all right? I'll say the magic word, grandkids. Yeah. See, you know, we, we understand something there. Anyway, Nebuchadnezzar was a man who, according to the Bible, was, was very, very radiant and rich, and he was very powerful, and he had a dream. He had a dream about a golden statue, and in this dream, he, he, he saw the statue, and, and, and he got this idea, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to build a statue in commemoration to me. Doesn't that sound like a wonderful thing to do? I mean, he's a, he's a, he's a politician. You ever notice when politicians talk, that's all they want to do? Well, I do this, I do that, I do this, I do this. I'm wonderful, you know. This man was not only a politician, he was a king, so he could say it. And he built this big statue, and he decided he was going to have a, 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 a service of worship, and he commanded that everybody in the kingdom come. Everybody. Now, in those days, when the king says you come, you come. That's just the way it was. And he got everybody to, together. The place is called the Plains of Dura. And they were all together. I have no idea how many people there were. A huge, huge crowd. And he said, listen, in just a minute, the worship team is going to fire up the music. And when the music starts, it is commanded that everyone here hit their knees and worship the, the golden statue that I've set up. He also used a little persuasion. He said, and by the way, if you decide not to worship my statue, we're going to throw you in a burning, fiery furnace. Just as an afterthought. So, everybody knows what we're going to do, right? Can you imagine that today? Can you imagine somebody trying to get us to do that? We talk about hitting our knees all the time. I can't hardly get Christian people to hit their knees sometimes. In this place... They were using persuasion that said, if you don't, you're going to the fire. So he turned around, the worship leader turned around to the band and said, hit it. They began to play the music. And everybody hit their knees and began to worship the golden image made to Nebuchadnezzar. Except for three Hebrew boys. Y'all know, know who they are, right? This is from the book of Daniel, right? Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, from the Old Testament, right? From the book of Daniel. They are not bowing. They are standing. And they had made their mind up that, you know what? I cannot compromise my convictions. They had decided that forever the word of the Lord was settled. And God said, do not worship any graven images. They decided we're not going to do it. If the whole culture bows down, we're still not going to do it. And the king has said, we're going to put you in a burning, fiery furnace. We're still not going to do it. So guess what? They're standing. Now, here's the way the devil will do it. If you decide to stand while everybody else is bowing, the devil will point you out. And they came to Nebuchadnezzar and said, ho, oh, king. You told everybody to bow. But there's three young people standing out there. They refuse to worship your image. So the king got, he got mad. 
And the king called in those three boys and brought them in and said, Listen, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, is it true that you do not bow down and worship my image? Is that so? He said, if, if, if this is the case, let me say it like this. He said, I'm going to give you a second chance. When you hear the worship music start again, you bow down, you worship my image, everything's fine. Otherwise, you're going this moment into that burning, fiery furnace. And then he made this statement. And who is your God that can save you from me? Pretty strong words, isn't it? Now, how many of you would agree that's a bad day? Huh? That's a pretty bad day, isn't it? Um, probably a lot worse than some of the days that we think are bad. I don't have anybody threatening to throw me in a burning furnace. Not lately, okay? I haven't had anybody threaten me lately. I have had people threaten me before, but not with that. So we can agree then these believers who have decided that the word of God is authoritative and settled, and they have decided we are not going to bow before this pagan king. We're not going to worship his image. And it doesn't matter if the whole world does it. We're not going to do it. So Nebuchadnezzar said, I'm going to give you a chance, number two. And guess what? They said, we're not going to do it. Look what they said. Put the scripture on the board, okay? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to give you an answer concerning this matter. You know what they said? They said, we don't even have to explain ourselves. They said, we don't have to think about it. And he said, if it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the furnace of blazing fire. He said, if it be so, my God can deliver me from you. But then he said... And he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. He's saying, look, you're threatening us with bodily harm, but I'm telling you that I have a God that can deliver us. And our God, if he is wanting to, he is able to deliver. But then notice something. He goes on to say this, the next verse. But if not, but even if he does not, let it be known to you, O king, that we are not going to serve your gods. Or worship the golden image that you've set up. Do you see what they said? They're saying we're not going to compromise on this. They're saying our God can, but even if he doesn't, we're not going to give in. Now, I want to submit to you that that's the attitude that you've got to have today. You've got to have the attitude that if God delivers me from this disease, or if he doesn't. If God delivers me from this problem, or if he doesn't. God delivers me from this situation, or if he doesn't. You see... God didn't promise that things would always go well. You're going to have bad days. You're going to have times when you suffer. And Christian people who believe that the word of God is settled in heaven and believe that God's ministry is faithful can trust God that even in the bad moment, even when you're standing before a pagan king and he's threatening you with bodily harm, God is faithful. And when these boys refused... What did the king do? He threw them in the furnace. They made a bad mistake, didn't they? They lost their life, didn't they? No. You need to read the rest of the story. Because they threw these boys in the furnace. And later on came back to the king and said, You need to go check out the furnace. There's something going on in there. Remember the king saying, Who is that God that can save you from me? He found out who that God was. Because he went back to the furnace and guess what he found? Put the scripture on the board. He said, look, I see four men loosed and walking about in the midst of the fire without harm. And the fourth, the appearance of the fourth is like a son of the gods. Now, let's see if we can get this picture. The Bible says that they were wrapped up in their own clothing, bound and thrown into the fire. But while they're in the fire, they're not bound anymore. They're walking around. You know what's going on? You see the problem that they had. The bad situation that came upon them didn't hurt them. It only burnt the things that had bound them. And when God puts you in a situation that's bad and difficult, understand this, Christian. 
He is working something in you. He is growing you. He is changing you. And when you get in the fire, the fire doesn't harm you. The fire just harms those things that are keeping you bound up in sin. Why would you be afraid of the fire if the fourth man is in the fire? Who was there with them? Nebuchadnezzar said he looks like a son of the gods. Let me give you a suggestion to who it was. And let me say this to you. If Jesus is in the fire, it's okay to be in the fire. No matter where he is, if he's there, it's okay to be there. And no matter what you're going to go through in your life, you will go through nothing that Jesus isn't there. Hmm. Yeah. He brings good out of the bad. Some of you are suffering through things that people can't, could have no idea about. And you say, I just don't see what's happening. Here's what I can tell you today. Just trust in Jesus. Because he is faithful to change you. And through the problems, he changes us. Not only is he faithful to change us, but he's faithful to keep us. He's faithful to keep us. When you give your life to him, your life is secure in him. When Jesus died on the cross and said, it is finished, it meant that the ransom was paid for you. And when you trust in Jesus as your personal Savior and receive Him by faith, and you give your life to Him and your heart to Him, then what happens is God has entered into a covenant with you. I'm reminding you of what Jesus said at the Last Supper when He held up the chalice. And He said, in this chalice is the blood of of the covenant, the new covenant that I make with you. Ladies and gentlemen, we're not saved today because we try hard. We're not saved today because we don't sin anymore. We're not saved today because we're good people or perfect people or anything. We're not saved today because of our effort. We are saved today because of what Christ has done for us. And He is faithful to keep us. Once you put your life into his hands, it belongs to him. And the Apostle Paul said to the Corinthian church that this church, that this, uh, church would be confirmed to the end. Listen, you might believe that you have disappointed God. You might think that your lack of faith has made him uh, somehow uh, not be sold out to you anymore. You might think that you've lived a life that he is so displeased with that he's just going to have to grudging you, grudgingly let you into heaven. But the truth of the matter is, the Apostle Paul said to Corinth that God will confirm you to the end and that you will be blameless. When you stand before Jesus having his righteousness, you are blameless. When God sees you through the blood of his son, he doesn't see what's wrong with you. He sees what's right because what is right with you is the righteousness that Jesus has. And he willingly and freely gives it to whoever will trust in him. You don't have to worry that one day he's going to change his mind about you. He's not going to send you a text and say, I'm breaking up. He's not going to tell you that I'm done with you. He is sold out to you to the point that he shed blood for you. He's faithful to keep us, to keep us blameless. Let me tell you something else. Some Christians live with guilt complexes. You can remember what you did last week, last month, last year, and, all, and you can't get over it. And you ask God to forgive you over and over and over, and it doesn't seem like you feel any better. And so you walk around with this affect that says, I'm guilty and I'm no good and I'm, 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 I'm tainted and, and I'm, I'm scarred and, and, and God doesn't really get pleasure in me anymore and, and I'm, I'm totally messed up and... Everything about you is your head is down. We sang today that song that says, you hold my head up. We read to you in this series of messages from Psalm 3 that said, you're the lifter of my head. Did you notice when someone's guilty, they can't lift their head up? And the reason why so many Christians are so miserable today is because you're walking around in guilt. But I want to show you what God's willing to do for you. 
Concerning your standing with him, your standing with him is secure in the blood of Jesus. Now your walk with him might be strained. You might say, what do I do when I mess up now? How, how do I deal with it now? Put the scripture on the board. He is faithful to forgive us when we confess. Look at the scripture. If we confess our sins, he is what? Faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins. When you get honest with God, when you admit the truth, God forgives you. You see, that's why being a fake never works. Fakers don't get forgiven. Fakers just put it on. And everything about fakers is an act. And they have to pretend. And God doesn't want you to pretend. God wants you to be real. God wants you to come before him just as you are. Let me give you something. Something I teach all the time. You want to learn how to love God more? I mean, did you notice you have to kind of learn that? You can't really just kind of, from your own flesh, decide to love Jesus more. Let me tell you how you can learn to love God more. By being honest with God. When you come in before God, be real. Admit the truth. Because when you admit the truth, you find that he's faithful to forgive you. And Jesus said, he that forgives much, loves much. You know why you don't love God very much? You're not very forgiven. You're not very forgiven. You know why? Because you're not very honest. If you walk around with a guilt complex, you're either not honest about your sin or you're just not trusting the faithfulness of God. Because God says when you confess our sins, he's faithful to forgive. If you say, I've, I've asked God to forgive me and he hasn't, wait a minute. He's faithful to do it. And what you need to learn to do is you need to learn how to accept his forgiveness. We tell people sometimes to do this. You need to learn to forgive yourself. If God forgives you, guess what? You're forgiven. And then he goes on to say, and to cleanse us from the unrighteousness. See, that's, that's the way people change. You change when you get honest about your sin. You get forgiven. And forgiven people behave differently. Everything I'm talking to you about today is simply this. That you can't change your own life. But being honest with a faithful God will because God is at work all around you. He's faithful to change us. He's faithful to keep us. He's faithful to protect us. 2 Thessalonians 3.3 3, But the Lord is faithful and he will strengthen and protect you from the evil one. How many of you are scared to death of the devil? Scared to death. What if the, what if the devil does this to me? Paul says God is faithful, will protect you from the evil one. Why in the world would we be, afraid, we'd be afraid of him? Let me tell you what the evil one does when he gets around God. He runs. He runs. He flees from the word of God. At the name of Jesus, demons run. So why should we be afraid? Thou, O Lord, art a shield about us. Not only is he faithful to protect us, but he is faithful when we are not. This is so very important. Because I know a lot of Christian people have a hard time getting over the fact that they've messed up. Something that was circulating in the early church, it was a trustworthy statement, 2 Timothy chapter 2. It says, if we died with him, we will also live with him. It says, if we endure, we will also reign with him. It says, if we deny him, he also will deny us. That has to do with our time before the judgment seat of Christ, but here's what I want to focus on. If we are faithless, he remains faithful, for he cannot deny himself. I want you to think about that. The commitment that Christ has made to you is based upon his word, not yours. And even when I'm unfaithful, can anybody in here admit that we've been unfaithful? Even when we're unfaithful, he is faithful. You know why? Because he cannot deny 
himself. We're already brought into partnership with him. We wear his name. We already have received his authority. We have already received a standing before Christ. The Bible calls us saints. The Bible says that we are now children of the Most High God. We are, we are together in this covenant. And he cannot deny himself. That's good news for somebody like me. Is that good news for you? You see, we're saved today by grace through faith. The Bible says by grace you've been saved through faith. The word grace means a gift. You've been saved by a gift. It's not anything that you've done. You did not work to get saved. You will not work to stay saved. We receive that grace by faith. We just simply believe it. God has provided it. God has offered it. We open our heart and we receive it. It's not of ourselves. It is the gift of God. And we live through this grace, through this faith. And when we put faith in God, God's salvation comes to us through his word and his word is faithful. That means that today I'm saved. I'm saved in the past from what I've already done. I'm saved, being saved in the present because God is changing me even today. I am saved in the future because there's already a hope laid up for me in heaven. So that means because of the faithfulness of God, I can have faith in God. That means for us today, we can change because he is faithful. We can take courage because he is faithful. We can continue because he is faithful. We can wait on the Lord because he is faithful. We can win because he is faithful. We can pray because he is faithful. We can praise because he is faithful. We can forgive others because he is faithful. We can follow because he is faithful. We can live today because he is faithful. We can let go of the past because he is faithful. We can love because he is faithful. We can lead because he is faithful. We can repent because he's faithful. We can risk it because he's faithful. We can resist evil because he's faithful. We can rejoice because he's faithful. Ladies and gentlemen, we can rest because he is faithful. I hope that you're singing that song all week. And in everything in your life, you stop looking at yourself as the standard and you look at him who is faithful. His word is faithful to you. And his ministry to you is faithful. And you might think he's been done with you a long time ago, but he's just getting started with you. And when he presents you to himself on that day, he presents you to himself blameless. In the day of Jesus Christ. Now some of you today. Need to hear this. See the truth is we live by faith. Not by feelings. Do you get that? Some of you today don't feel very righteous. Some of you. Don't feel very saved. The truth is. If you have done what the Lord says. In the scriptures you're saved. If you have. Received Jesus. Jesus. As your personal Savior, you're saved. Jesus said so many times, so many different places, God loved the world and he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have what? Everlasting life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be what? Saved. Through who? Through Jesus. Romans says, if we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in our heart that God's raised him from the dead, we shall be what? Saved, all right? For with the heart man believeth unto salvation, with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Amen? Amen? By grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Amen? Amen? It's so clear. The facts are, if you have received Jesus, you're saved. And your feelings, although they might be real, if they're wrong, it's because they're not based upon the facts. Faith is based on facts. When feelings are wrong, our facts are wrong. 
So what we do today is we get the facts right. Get the facts right. Have you confessed Christ? Have you received Jesus? Have you been born again? Those are the facts. You say, well, I don't feel very spiritual, okay? Let's get the facts right. That no matter where you are today, God cannot deny himself. God is faithful to protect you. He's faithful to keep you. He's faithful to change you. He's faithful to give you hope today. He's faithful to present you confirmed to the end. He's faithful to present you to his own father blameless in his sight. Those are the facts. He's faithful that if you'll confess your sins today, he will forgive you today and cleanse you from all unrighteousness today. Get the facts right, then the feelings change. Facts plus feelings equals peace. And the Bible says this in Romans 5.1, having been justified by faith, we have what? Peace with God. You know why we have peace with God? Because we just simply receive his free gift. And that enmity, that warfare we had with him is over. God loves you today. And I want you to know that there's a God who's faithful. And even when we're not, he's still faithful. And your life can change today and this week and this month and this year because of his faithfulness. Stop trying so hard and start trusting him and watch what he does for your life.